we heard in the epistle a beautiful description of who Jesus is. This is Paul's letter to the Colossians. He says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. He had said himself to Philip during his earthly ministry, when Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough. And he says, Philip, have I been with you this long and you still do not know? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In the Old Testament, the people heard the voice of God. They saw fire. They saw smoke. Lots of noise. They experienced a hint of His glory. But then His glory became fully manifest to them. And His name is Jesus Christ. As St. John shows us in his prologue, Jesus is that revelation of the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. But what does that mean for us? Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That's beautiful. Beautiful, St. Paul. But what does that mean to us? Jesus has taken on a real human nature. A nature that had fallen from grace. How did this occur? You know the story so tragically in the garden. God had made man in his own image and likeness. He had made Adam and Eve as his own children. And he was their father. And he, the image and likeness, you know what this means, right? I mean, look in the mirror, you look like your parents. I mean, Tom Gomez is here, I knew his father, the spitting image here. Okay, now many of you look at the children. They look like Tom and Paula. <coughs> Many of you know Rob Gomez, who is playing hooky today. So, uh, off in another church, I suppose. Looks like his father. We look like our parents. And this is what it means that God made man in his image and likeness. He made mankind out of all of creation. He made mankind as his own children. And this reveals then in His creation of mankind and as His children, it reveals first and foremost our most important understanding of God and that He is our Father. Now, what did man do with this incredible gift he had been given in all of creation to be made in the image and likeness of God? What does that mean? This doesn't mean that we physically look like God. This is an error of modern sect called Mormonism. That if man's made in the image of God, that means God must you know, look like man. No, no, you got the whole thing turned around here. Uh, some would say, oh, it, it has to do with our ability to, to procreate. God creates and so we, we can make more of ourselves and so we kind of participate in that. Well, the animals do that very well. But they're not made in the image and likeness of God. God even blessed the animals and said, be fruitful and multiply, just like He said to mankind. So that's not what makes us unique. What makes us unique in all of creation is that we have a rational soul. We are rational beings. What that means is we can make decisions between what is right and what is wrong. We have been given a free will. A free will. The freedom to choose God. And without freedom, there is no love. Often, you know, we ponder, why would God give man free will? It's so dangerous. Well, because it's also so beautiful. Without free will, man cannot freely love God. This is an incredible gift He has given us. Without free will, without the ability to not choose Him, we then don't have the freedom to choose Him. And it's only in true freedom that you have true love. And so God has given us this very, very dangerous power which we can do horrible things 
with that power. But He's given us that power for something good. He's given us the freedom to choose Him, to choose what is right. God is a rational being, and we were made in His image and likeness. We choose what is good. At least this is what we were created to do. To grow up in His image and likeness. In the garden, He gave Adam and Eve certain responsibilities and certain rules. Those rules and responsibilities were not just uh, some laws that He made up to just kind of hinder Adam. Those laws are directions. They are equivalent to the, the information in the manual in your car. If it says, change your oil every 3,000 miles, and you don't do that, you're not hurting the manufacturer. They'll be very happy if you don't change your oil. They'll like that. They're not going to affect GM or Chrysler or Toyota. No, no. They're happy if you don't change your oil because they're going to go buy another one someday. But they tell you to change your oil. If you want this car to do what we've created it to do for you and to last this many years and this many miles, well, then you have to follow certain rules. Now, we could say, well, I just don't agree with that. I don't think it's fair that Toyota tells me I should change my oil every 3,000 miles. That's not fair. They're trying to hinder me from being happy. I'm not really free. They're trying to bind me in. See what happens. See what happens. I know of one poor lady who had no idea about changing oil and she bought a nice Toyota Camry and she drove it for, I think, somewhere around 80,000 miles or something without ever having changed the oil. Didn't even know about it. She bought it at the store, you know, at the car store. She drove home and she drove it nicely, just put gas in it. You got to about 80,000 or somewhere. Amazing, a Toyota Camry. And then all of a sudden the whole thing just seized up. It was done. She took it to a mechanic. What's wrong? They towed it there. The man looked in there and said, what did you do to this motor? So she had, tragically, out of ignorance, not taken care of her car. Now what happens if you go to the gas station and you decide to put diesel, because it's maybe cheaper at this particular gas station, in your car that runs on gasoline? Or let's say you go and you find that gas is cheaper and you have a nice diesel Mercedes or something. You say, well, I'm going to put gas in there. I'm not, these people are trying to bind me in. No, those rules, it says right there, use unleaded fuel only. It's there to help you, to protect you, and for that car. So it'll, this is what God gives us in His laws. Every parent understands this, because when we make rules in the household, hopefully we make them like God. That is, for the protection and good of the family and our children. We have rules there that are intended, like the rules in the car manual, to, uh, to help our children and our family and everything work properly and our children grow up properly into our image and likeness. And so, God has given us His laws, His rules. And what did Adam and Eve do with it? Well, I, don't, I feel a little bound in by this. I'm not sure if God really is, has my best interest in mind. He says, don't eat of that fruit. If I eat of it, I... Come on. If I could have that, that one thing He said I can't have, then I could be happy. Now, we understand this. This is what we all do. I don't know about you, but I do this about 365 times a day. This is called sin. We look at the world around us, in our workplace, in the store, in our family, on the computer, or whatever, and we say, ah... If I could have that, then I would be happy. And we know that God has said, that's not good for you. But we say, no, no, but if I just have it, I'll be happy. I'll have fulfillment. And of course, when we have that thing, whatever it is, then we say, it didn't seem to really pan out. It's like putting the diesel in the gasoline car. It doesn't seem to work anymore. And we realize how foolish that was. But it seemed like a great idea at the moment. And that's what happened with Adam and Eve. God had told them, don't eat of the fruit of this tree, and the day you eat of it, you will die. Why would God put such a dangerous thing in that world? Well, don't we have dangerous things in our worlds? Don't we as parents have knives in the kitchen, and wood stoves, and electric, electricity, and all sorts of stuff in the house, which are all good. They're all good. 
but you don't let a little three-year-old drive a pickup truck. Right? That road out there that we all got here on, it was very good. It was very good. It got us here. It did its job. But we don't let little children play in it. The cars out there, they're good. They did their job. As long as we take care of them, they'll continue to be good. And so, the same thing. God put a tree in the garden which was good, and according to the fathers of the church, it was something that Adam and Eve would have been allowed to eat of when they were ready, when they were prepared. But, as we know in our own life, even especially those of you who have children know, they're always wanting whatever it is they want at that moment, even when we say, it's not for you yet. That's not for you. And so, and so Adam and Eve chose to turn away from their father. They broke their relationship. The moment they reached out for that fruit, their relationship with their heavenly father was broken. How? God didn't break any relationship. They did. They had turned away from their father and no longer trusted him and thought that they knew better and that this serpent knew better than their loving father. And in their heart at that moment, they broke their relationship with their loving father. And their loving father was their source of life. And so, as we find, what does God do like any loving father when he hears his kid hurt out in the, in the, in the backyard? or whatever? God comes on the scene immediately. St. John Christendom says, like a, like a physician to the bed of his sick patient. This is Dr. Michelle, this is back when the doctors used, still do house visits. He ran all the way to the bed of his sick patient. And, and he came and he found Adam and Eve in a horrible state. And what does he do? He immediately gives them the opportunity for medicine. He gives them the opportunity to repent. He says, Adam, what did you do? And after a number of interrogations and blaming each other, well, she did it. You know, the one that you put with me, she's the one. It's her fault, which is your fault, because you put her here. And then I ate. Yes, I did. So they eventually admitted to what they did, but admittance of something is not the same as repentance. There are many axe murderers and serial killers in prison who will tell you with great zeal and detail everything they've ever done, every horrible thing they've ever done. And if you ask them, would you do it again? They'll say, oh, yeah. Let me out of this place and I'll kill another hundred people. There's no repentance there. There is admittance of what they've done, the evil, but that's not, that's not repentance. Ideally, these things go hand in hand, but often they don't. And so God was allowing them the opportunity to repent and they did not. And so He cast them out of the garden that day. They cast them out of the garden that day because now there was something much more dangerous in the home. And that was the tree of life. He had given them this tree of life to eat freely of whenever they needed. But now there was a problem. They had turned away from Him. They had broken their relationship with Him. They did not trust Him. They did not love Him. And if they were to eat of the tree of life in this state, then they would live bodily for all eternity while they were dead to their father in their soul. And a loving father does not want that for his children. And so what he does is he sends them out of the garden. Just like any father would do in the household. If the child is playing with the knives in the kitchen, and then you say, don't do this, and then you come in and they're cutting you know, themselves and they, they, they injured one of the other children, you don't, let, you don't say, okay, alright, now please don't do that again. Uh, while well, there's boiling frying oil in the frying pan, you say, now, I'm going to go over here in the living room for a second, just don't touch the boiling oil. So God is a loving Father knowing what they've done and for their own protection now sends them out of the kitchen, sends them out of the garden, out of a place where there is something more dangerous now. Lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever bodily while dead to their loving Father. And so they're tossed out of the garden for their own protection. And then eventually what happened in their soul to be spiritually dead to God, eventually manifested in their bodies. And we know that story all too well. Here we are today. 
But God, being a loving Father, reached out to His children over and over and brought them back into relationship with Him in minor degrees through the covenants of the Old Testament. Until finally, He sent His Son in His own image and likeness eternally who could show us what Adam was supposed to be. Man, fully alive with the Spirit of His Heavenly Father, walking in His ways. His will and God's will perfectly united. And what did we do with Him? Nothing different than what Adam did in the garden. We killed Him. The Jews put Him to death that day. They didn't want Him. They didn't like Him. They did not love Him as Adam had not loved God in the garden. But God is a loving Father and He raised His Son from the dead. The Jews killed Him on that day, but God raised Him from the dead. Christ is risen. Christos Anesti. Al Messiah come. Christ is risen. And He has been raised from the dead for our salvation. We who have been baptized into Him, as St. Paul says in his letters to the Romans, have been baptized into His death and His resurrection so that we may never die again. I say, Father, I know this story. I, mean, I, I, I know lots of people who have died and been baptized. Yes, Adam died the day he turned away from his loving Father in his spirit. But his body eventually resulted in death as well. And on the day you were baptized into Christ, you were changed spiritually into a resurrected being, which will have a physical resurrection as a result at the end. How so? Because in your baptism, you were drawn, not from the murky waters of the first creation like Adam, but from the pristine and pure waters of the baptismal font. And you had, again, the life breath of God blown into your nostrils in holy chrismation when the priest laid his hands upon you and chrismated you with the holy oil. You are now a new creation in Christ and you were then welcomed into the church on that day to receive his body and blood, the fruit of the tree of life, of which he says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life in him and I will, I will, I will raise him on the last day. That's Jesus' words. And that's why we receive the Holy Eucharist as often as we are possibly able. This is why we give the Holy Eucharist to even babies. Because as Saint, even St. Saint Augustine says, he says, how can you expect a little child to be raised from the dead who has not been both baptized and received his life-giving body and blood? And this is why the early church took the communion of not only adults, but infants very seriously. Jesus said, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life in Him, and I will raise Him up on the last day. That is the hope that we have when we lay our loved ones in the tomb. That is the hope we have when we close that coffin and put them in the earth. That is the hope we have when we close our eyes to this world and await our own bodily resurrection. And our hope is in Christ, who promised that He would raise us from the dead. He would restore us to the image and likeness of God. And that process has already begun today. We live as Christians today, awaiting the second coming of Christ. And we are slowly, as St. Paul says in the second letter of the Corinthians, being changed day by day. This is a process we call in the Eastern Church theosis, becoming change, changing slowly into the image and likeness of God over time. So that as we live on this earth, we begin to speak more and more and act more and more like our Heavenly Father until all things are restored in His second coming. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the revelation of our loving Father. But then who are we on earth by virtue of our baptism? We are members of His body, which means we have been restored to the image and likeness of our Heavenly Father. And what an incredible calling we have. Often we think it would be nice if Jesus would come back and clean up all this mess here on this earth. 
Well, look in the mirror. He's already here. But the problem is the members of the body of Christ are not standing up and living the life of Christ. We are not walking in the ways of Christ. We are not being the mouthpiece for the words of Christ. And so we see all this corruption in the world, in the government, in the church, to the highest levels. Because we, as Christians, do not stand up and be the image and likeness of our Heavenly Father to the world. And so we have an incredible calling today to glorify Jesus Christ, not only today, but until His second coming, that He may be glorified in our lives with His eternal Father, and His all-holy good and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages. Amen.